uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Shi, Shi Dai. Uh, I'm from University of Waterloo. Uh, today, I'll be talking about a dissipative lambda zener tunneling uh, measurements we have done where we have found evidence for a crossover from weak to strong environment coupling. Uh, this work is uh, led by me and Robin from University of Waterloo. Help uh, from others on on device design and uh, with Lincoln Lab on uh, for the device uh, fabrication and uh, experiment infrastructures, uh, as well as uh, theory support from uh, USC. So uh, uh, the lambda zener problem is a, a, a famous problem where you have two interacting levels uh, where you start uh, in the infinite past uh, in one of the states and then you linearly sweep the energy separation between the two levels and they come together forming a, a anti-crossing with gap delta and then linearly uh, goes away again. And the problem is uh, what is the transition probability? So if you start in the blue states What's the probability that it remains in the blue states at the end of the sweep? Yes. And, and I can't, can't use a laser here. So yeah, so this problem has a, a simple solution in the coherent limit that uh, the transition probability is given by this uh, exponential of, of uh, this uh, factor of delta square over V, where delta is a minimum gap or the tunneling amplitude, and V is a sweep rate. And this problem is uh, relevant for a wide range of uh, physical phenomena, uh, including atomic collisions, chemical reactions, uh, molecular magnets, and, and of course, quantum annealing. And physical realizations of uh, the landau zener problem are always uh, affected by dissipation or, or coupling to the environment. And there have been a broad interest on a theoretical modeling of the dissipative landau zener problems. And for, and I have just uh, listed some of the more prominent uh, references here. So what this uh, problem has to do with quantum annealing exactly. So in quantum annealing, uh, we would like, or at least in the conventional quantum annealing, we would like to uh, have an adiabatic evolution so that the system stays in the ground state and uh, eventually ends up in the low energy state of an Ison Hamiltonian, which corresponds to a, a hard problem that we want to solve. And this is despite uh, the systems going through uh, some minimum gap in the middle of the evolution. And dissipation is an important uh, factor in determining the success probability or the probability that the system can remain in a ground state. Uh, so in the weak coupling limit, uh, there's a trade-off between adiabaticity and thermal excitations uh, in that if you go too fast, uh, if you go too slow, uh, you are adiabatic, but uh, thermal excitations can bring you out of the ground state. And if you go too fast, uh, you end up having uh, non-adiabatic transitions uh, out of the ground state as well. And uh, in the strong system bath coupling limit, uh, there have also studies uh, shown that uh, tunneling occurs uh, between entangled system and bath states instead of uh, just a system uh, energy eigen state. So that also uh, complicates the situation. And uh, also that there's a very limited exploration uh, in the intermediate uh, coupling range. And uh, we believe that doing this uh, dissipative landau zener transition measurements, although it's a two-level problem, it can shed light uh, in understanding the evolution of a large system of an annealer uh, during the small gap evolution.
So uh, we perform our measurements on a superconducting flux qubit, which is uh, one of the most uh, common building blocks for quantum annealers. And it has a qubit Hamiltonian uh, that has this uh, epsilon sigma z and delta sigma x. So these two coefficients, uh, epsilon and delta, are controlled by two external flux biases on the qubits, uh, which we call sigma z and sigma x. And if you look at the uh, two-level pictures that represent the potential energy of the flux qubit, you can see that uh, uh, phi z controls the tilt between the two, two wells, so that controls uh, epsilon. And phi x controls the uh, tunneling barrier between the two states, so that controls uh, a delta term. And there have been previous uh, landau zinner measurements in flux qubits. So in 2005, uh, the MIT team uh, performed uh, landau zinner stuckerberg interference, uh, sorry, which is uh, uh, basically measuring the steady state population after repeatedly going through the uh, uh, landau zinner transitions. And they've uh, incorporated uh, decoherence effect using some phenomenological uh, T2 parameter. And in 2009, uh, DOA group also performed uh, a single passage landau zinner transition. And they found that their data agrees with uh, uh, a strong coupling model, which is uh, the MRT theory, microscopic resonant tunneling. And interestingly, they found that using uh, their data and, and this model shows that in this strong coupling limit, the transition rate is actually the same as a coherent uh, landau zinner transition rate. Okay, so our experimental setup, uh, to control the qubit, we have a DC current that's coupled to the X flux of the qubit that allows us to set the tunneling amplitude delta, and we have a DC and a fast AWG combined to control the Z flux, so that allows us to sweep the uh, uh, Z flux with different time scales. And we also have a capacitively coupled uh, microwave signal to do spectroscopy and coherence measurement uh, on the qubit. And to read out the qubit state, we use uh, transmission measurement through a flux sensitive resonator. That's this uh, blue circuit here. And the measurement protocol is pretty simple. Uh, we prepare the qubit ground state in the far left of the symmetry point at, at time zero, and then we linearly sweep uh, phi z from phi z initial to phi z final uh, with time uh, TLZ. And yeah, then we just uh, measure the state populations in the end. So first, uh, we want to look at the transition probability in the short time scales where we expect the system to be uh, coherent. So we, we show the final excited state probabilities uh, as a function of TLZ, also for various uh, phi x. And as expected, uh, you can see that with the uh, increase in TLZ, uh, PE decreases uh, exponentially. And that's in line with the prediction of the coherent landau zinner formula. So we fit uh, the landau zinner formula to the uh, measurement data, and that allows us to extract an effective gap parameter, uh, delta LZ. And we can compare the uh, delta measured by the landau zinner transition with our circuit model uh, that's shown on the plot on the right. The orange dots are the 
gap measured by the Landau Zener transition, and the circuit model uh, is obtained by fitting uh, to the spectroscopy measurement. Uh, that's this uh, green triangles here. And we see a very good agreement uh, between the circuit model and uh, delta LZ. And just want to highlight that this, this agreement is quite remarkable because uh, the circuit model is only fitted to spectroscopy data, which is at uh, around a few gigahertz for the qubit transition frequency. And we found that uh, this model extrapolates, uh, even when extrapolating to like tens of megahertz, uh, it still agrees with the uh, landau zener measured uh, minimum gap delta. Uh, so after confirming the behavior at short time scales, uh, we look at uh, the full time range that we have uh, measured. So here I'm showing the final ground state probability as a function of TLZ uh, plotted in log scale and for a different uh, phi x. And we can see that for large phi x corresponding to large uh, minimum gap, uh, uh, corresponds to this uh, orange curve here. We have a non-monotonic dependence of the final ground state probability with respect to the sweep time TLZ. And this is in line with the a competition between adiabaticity in the short time scale and uh, thermalization near the gaps uh, in the intermediate time scale and uh, thermal relaxation at the end of the sweep in the long, the long time scale. Uh, however, at a small gap or a small phi x, uh, let's look at this uh, greenish curve on the right here, we see that uh, the behavior is quite different. Uh, PG increases uh, monotonically and it's uh, quite close to the uh, coherent limit. And as a result of this, we also see that the PG curves for different phi x actually crosses at some, some large sweep time. Uh, and what this means is that uh, if the sweep time is large enough, you actually get a higher ground state probability when the minimum gap is smaller. This is quite counterintuitive. And yeah. Uh, so next, uh, I'll discuss our open system models to, to try to understand the data. Uh, we consider a qubit coupled to uh, the Z flux noise uh, given in this form HQB here. Uh, so the flux noise operator Q, it couples to the qubit uh, sigma Z operator uh, with a proportionality constant of uh, IP, which is a persistent current of the qubit. And, and uh, we consider a combination of uh, 1 over F and omic noise spectrum for the flux noise, uh, which is uh, verified and measured by many pre previous uh, experiments on flux noise. And finally, we deduce the uh, noise amplitude parameters uh, based on our uh, coherence measurements, or T1 and T2, uh, as a function of flux biases. So first we consider a weak coupling to the environment uh, which can be modeled by the adiabatic master equation. So in this limit, uh, the environment uh, acts as a perturbation uh, leading to thermal transitions between uh, energy eigenstates. So we can see that it, at large phi x, it it predicts this uh, non-monotonic dependence of PG on TLZ, which agrees with our, with our experiment data. But at, at small phi x, it, it almost 
uh, plateaued near 0.5, uh, which uh, shows that this weak coupling limit does break down when the minimum gap is small. Uh, uh, next, we consider the uh, strong coupling limit, uh, which we model using the Polaron transformed uh, master equation. Uh, in this model, uh, the effect of uh, 1 over f noise uh, is given in terms of this uh, MRT parameters, the MRT width w and the uh, reorganization energy epsilon p, uh, which are given in terms of the uh, integrals of the, uh, the noise spectrum. And, and in this model, uh, the environment dresses the persistent current states. And, and so, so system energy eigenstate uh, just no longer uh, describes a uh, uh, system anymore. And uh, your tunneling delta becomes a perturbation parameter. And you see that the uh, a, a Its prediction uh, agrees with our measurement data in the small phi x limit, but not in the large phi x limit. Uh, finally, we can also compare the data and the, the two models, the AME and the PDRE, by plotting our result uh, versus this dimensionless time uh, tau. And and we, we can observe the, some additional features, uh, which is that uh, whether in the AME, AME or the PTRE model, we see these uh, different curves uh, for different phi x almost collapsed at long times. Uh, whereas in our data, the, uh, it kind of interpolates the AME result in the large phi x uh, limit to the PTRE result in the small phi x uh, limit. Uh, okay, so just to summarize, uh, we saw that uh, when the evolution time TLZ is small, uh, the, the measured transition probabilities are close to the coherent limit, and it's, uh, this is independent of the gap size of the problem. And then in the large gap uh, limit, there's a non-monotonic dependence on the ground state probability on TLZ, uh, consistent with the weak coupling limit results as that has been studied by previous uh, uh, literatures. And in the small gap limit, uh, PG becomes monotonic, uh, which is also consistent with a strong coupling to a low frequency noise. And just to highlight that uh, the peculiar feature that the crossing of different PG curves for a different uh, phi x, and you end up having higher ground state probability uh, when, when the gap is smaller at long evolution times. Okay. Uh, I think I have, I will just have a outlook slides here. The, okay, so I guess I, I can leave it here. Uh, okay. So let's thank our speaker. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, Questions? I should say uh, I want to acknowledge ADAPA, our funding uh, agencies, uh, as well as our, our collaborators in the QEO program where we have uh, many helpful discussions on the experiments. Thanks for the nice review of the data. Um, uh, if you uh, went to a qubit that had uh, smaller circulating currents, um, and so kind of less coupling to flux noise, how, do, how would this data change? I guess it would be more towards the weak coupling limit, or just maybe, I shouldn't speculate, you can tell me. You yes, know, so, you so what I expect based on the trend is that uh, you, you'd still have a transition from weak to strong coupling, but that happens at a 
at a smaller minimum gap. So here you can see that uh, the, uh, the transition happens at around like say, like, so it's about 50 megahertz or so. And that, that corresponds to the, uh, to the W, the MRT width, more or less. So, so if you have uh, 10, 10 times smaller uh, persistent current, uh, you, you'd have the weak coupling limit will stay, uh, stay longer. So, so it, it can go below, uh, go around five megahertz and still remains a weak coupling. Yeah, that's my expectation. Other questions? Okay, if not, let's thank the speaker again and we go for a conference.